Good morning. If you're glad to be a Christian, would you say amen? amen. It's good to be together. I, I really do think about things like this. I wonder what the church will be like in another 10 or 20 years. I'm talking about the church of Christ right here at Wiley. That's going to be our focus for a little while. Because I think it's so healthy and it's so right that we continue to look inward just a little bit to make sure that we are being who God wants us to be. So the question that is before us today is a very sobering question. Are we the church Jesus built? Are we being that church? I think it's a fair question. I think it can be a difficult question. But I would like to know how are we going to do our best? What are we going to do to do our best to make sure that the church continues right here at Wiley to be the church that she should be? What are we going to do to do that? We must do the right things now. Brethren, we should do, we must do the right things now. Today we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to look today at the Ephesus warning. I think it's so vital that we continue to look to Scripture to see what the church should look like, how the church should operate, what her mission should be. We should study the church of Jesus Christ in Scripture so that we can guard against trying to make it look like something in our culture or even another church in our past, the church like we grew up in. I got to tell you, Jesus isn't concerned about you being the church that you grew up in. He wants you to be the church that he built. He, he doesn't want you to be the church that's down the, the, down the road or across town or out west of here or out east of here or down south of here or up north of here. He wants us, brethren, me and you, he wants us to be the church that he Built. Let's look at it closely. Matthew, 9, Matthew chapter 16. Let's look at it together before we get into Revelation 2. Matthew 16 and verse 13. Here's what the gospel says. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Immerser. Others say Elijah, but others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Okay, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter spoke up. He likes to do that. And Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Messiah. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus turns to Simon and says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood is not revealed. There ain't no man that's revealed this to you. But my Father who is in heaven. But I say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Brethren, I need you to see how the church is kingdom, and kingdom is the church. Jesus is the one who does this. He says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And what, in other words, the kingdom of the church or the keys to the church. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And clearly this is Jesus' church that he is speaking about. And then Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, he says these words. Ephesians 1 and verse 22 and Jesus put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So then, brethren, it's only fitting that we go to the prophecy, at least we start out at the end and work our way through, and we go to the prophecy of the New Testament that is Revelation. 
so that we can see what kind of warnings and admonitions that he gives to seven different churches, the seven churches of Asia. And it's going to be our task on Sunday mornings for a little while to apply those warnings, to apply those challenges to the Wiley Church of Christ. Because I'm not interested in talking about what other churches are doing. They have their own leaderships. They're going to be accountable. They have their own lampstand, if you will, and we have ours. And I know we can learn a lot from what a lot of people are doing, but I've just noticed some things kind of being in this area. It's amazing how often we talk about all the other churches out there. Let's talk about us. Let's talk about us. What are we doing that we need to keep doing? And what are we doing that we need to stop doing? Do we need some warnings? Because I can tell you now, from being loosely associated with a lot of preachers and a lot of other churches, it's very easy for one thing to happen or one person to rise up or one thing to be taught only to look up and our children are left with an empty building. So is this going to be a practical lesson? A practical series? You better believe it. As a matter of fact, it's going to be so practical, some of it's going to hurt a little bit. Some of it's going to sting a little bit. Because I'm not interested in church pep rallies. Go us. We're the right ones. We've got this figured out because those are the ones. Those are the ones where Satan creeps in. I'm interested in looking at who we are and who we need to be and what God wants us to be so that we can live to the fullest potential for every opportunity that comes because he hasn't come yet for that second round. He hasn't come back to get us. He's giving us more patience and more time. There's a lot more souls out there to be won. And we need to be busy doing the work of the Lord, doing kingdom work. And so here's what he says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, and we'll go through 5. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write this. John's recording what Jesus is telling these individual churches. Are you with me, brethren? The one who holds the seven stars in his hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, who is that? It's the head of the church. It's Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he's talking to this church at Ephesus. And he says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men. You put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they're not. You found them to be false. And you got perseverance and endurance for my name's sake, and you haven't grown weary, but I got this against you. And now I'm reading this letter, and my stomach sinks and starts to hurt. <laughs> because Jesus, the head of the body, says, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great, but. So, you know, I want to give you a little bit of background, and then we'll come back to this. Ephesus was called the jewel of Asia. It was the center of trade in that part of the world. It was the home to the temple of Artemis, that is Diana. Actually, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world found there in Ephesus. It was magnificent. It was cultured. It was prosperous. Its ruins lie in present-day Turkey and are extensive and impressive, I've read and heard. The gospel spread like wildfire in Paul's day in Ephesus. He spent three years laboring in this city. 
And clearly, according to Acts chapter 20, the apostle became really close to the shepherds at the Ephesus Church of Christ. The apostle John lived in Ephesus from somewhere between 20 and 30 years of his life. In the letter to Ephesus, the church is referred to, in this letter, the church is referred to as a lampstand, as are all the congregations. And Jesus begins this letter to this church with five or six things that they ought to keep doing well and doing right. What are they? Real quick. Man, I see your good deeds. Keep that up. Your Christian service is strong. Meeting the needs of others. Keep going. Oh, and your perseverance is impressive. And by the way, I love how you're dealing with the evil men and the false apostles. The idea is that you would imply from this is that their doctrine is still really strong because they know how to refute evil men or those who are claiming to be apostles. No, no, Ephesus, keep that up. And they stayed patient with each other. They labored in the name of Jesus and they did not become weary in a wearisome, doing wearisome tasks. I love that about you, church. <laughs> in other words, it was a congregation that you would be impressed with looking in from the outside. It would be one that you would want to be involved with and you would want to place membership at. It's one that's highly known in the community. But the church of Jesus Christ at Ephesus had one major life-threatening flaw. And that's why Jesus gives them this strong warning. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. But I have this against you. You've left your first love. Today, I want to challenge us and I want us to accept two major lessons that I've drawn out of this passage from this church to apply directly to me and to you. To every member here to every Bible class teacher, to every senior saint that we have living faithfully, to every shepherd, to every deacon, to the preacher himself, every one of us need these two lessons. And here they are. Lesson number one, any Christian or any group of Christians can walk away from eternal salvation in Jesus. You have to know this. It's a sobering lesson. It's a sobering truth, isn't it? But listen, let me be clear. No external force can remove you from Christ Jesus. Are you listening this morning? No external force can remove you from Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? Distress? Hardship? Famine? Name it. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Praise God. But let me also be clear, the Bible, almost on every other page, makes it clear that any person, any church, at any given time, can turn him or herself away from the Lord. Because Jesus gives this startling truth, I will remove your lampstand out of its place, verse 5. You see, the church of Jesus Christ at Ephesus was one of the lampstands. And I will tell you, if this concept isn't true, these seven letters are of no value. They're of no value. There's this running theme throughout almost all of the seven letters. I like some of this of what you're doing, but some of this other stuff you need to change. Repentance. Repentance is a theme, one of the themes running through these letters. And if you don't, I'm going to remove your church. I'm going to remove your lampstand. Jesus makes it abundantly clear to the Christians in Ephesus that when someone loses 
their first love, that person can lose their soul. They're on their way to losing their soul. This is why James said what he said in James chapter 5, and verse 19 and 20. Listen to these words. My brethren, if any one among you strays from the truth, turn him back. Let him know that if he turns a sinner from the error of his ways, he will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. You see, no, no external force can remove us from Christ, but an internal force can. Your heart. Your heart is the thing that can remove you from Christ Jesus. Because if you can say yes to Jesus, you get to say no to Jesus. If you can say I do, you can also say I won't. Because that's how God works. He doesn't do just like half the equation. No, I'll let you in, but you have no other choices to get out. That's not how God works. He didn't work that way with the children of old, the Israelites. And he doesn't work that way with us as Christians today. And yes, praise God that he's slow to anger. We're studying that on Wednesday nights. Exodus 34. I'm so happy that we serve a God who is slow to anger. But there's a point at which he tips the cup over, the cup of wrath, the bowl of wrath, throughout all of Old Testament and New Testament scripture. There's a point he holds it steady, but he's not going to hold it steady forever. So yes, any individual Christian and any church can walk away from eternal salvation in Jesus. But here's lesson two. Any Christian or any group of Christians can be busy doing the Lord's work and still have deadly heart problems. As a matter of fact, it can look really good from the outside. All throughout the history of God's people, we watch this truth right here stand, and that is repentance or removal. Turn back to God or be turned down by God. Turn back to God or be turned down by God. It was a central message of virtually all the prophets. Let me allow Joel chapter 2 sum up the prophets for us. Listen to these words, my brethren. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yet now, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart. With fasting and weeping and mourning and rend your heart, not your garments. Listen, I'm, I'm, I don't need you tearing your clothes anymore. Isn't that what they would do? They would rend their garments sackcloth and ashes stuff. And God goes, I don't need any more torn clothes. I need torn hearts. That's what needs to happen. I'm telling you, it's the theme all through. Now, he says, now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger. This is Joel 2. Slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. And he quotes God talking about himself from Exodus 34 that we're studying on Wednesday nights. It's the running theme, though. And I can tell you, as far as the church goes in Ephesus, look how she started out. Acts chapter 19, listen to this. And verse 17, this became known to all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in Ephesus. And they fell, great fear fell upon them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed, those new Christians, they kept coming and believing, confessing, disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together, began burning them in the sight of everyone. They counted up the price of them and found it to be about 50 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. You see, this is what people do when they fall in love with Jesus, is they want to give up 
worldly things and evil things for Jesus, and we start out really strong, or at least I hope we do, we've done this with some youth groups. Hey guys, listen, let's talk about this passage. Let's talk about what it is to love Jesus in every area of your life. Now, some of you are listening and watching things that do not honor Jesus. It honors evil. It honors Satan. Next Wednesday night, next Tuesday night, as we would have that Bible study together with a group of kids, we're going to bring our stuff and put them all out in the middle of the floor. We're going to break it all. We did that with this youth group. We had 20 kids come on Tuesday night. And we had a pile of video games, DVDs, CDs, like this right here. And they started breaking them. I mean, I just, that sounds biblical to me, does it to you? That was the heart that the church of Ephesus had. We have things in our life that do not magnify Jesus, and we're going to get them out. That's how they started. But brethren, it's not just how you start. It's the journey, and it's how you finish. You've got to finish this. And then comes this letter from Jesus. And so they started out with a tremendous change. Their love was strong. Their faith was strong. They were all in with their hearts. But they were going through the motions now. I mean, it's like the man who marries the love of his life. The first 10 years or so. Difficult, but so exciting. They do everything together. And their hearts, that man and that woman, their hearts are undivided. But because he doesn't intentionally work on his marriage, and he gets all caught up in life and his career, and he doesn't keep the first things first, and even though this old boy still provides, he still protects, he still, it looks good from the outside, he's still living under the same roof, he still speaks the same language of marriage, his heart isn't in it anymore. His love has dwindled, his heart is divided. That's the church at Ephesus. I mean, you're still speaking the language of love, church. I still see what you're doing in the community. you got a great reputation even. But on the inside, there's a deadly flaw. You've left your first love. But what love is this? Well, it's agape. It's the, it's the one we know. It's the unselfish commitment based on will type of love. But is this a love for Jesus that they left? Is this a love for others that they left? I would submit to you, yes. And yes. You know why? Because 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20, John, the one who wrote this prophecy, listen to what he says. If someone says, I love God, but he hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he, has see, whom he sees, cannot love God whom he's not seen. This commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. They're one in the same do you see that with me, church? What love have they lost? What did they leave? Love for others and love for God. Love for God and love for others, both. Do you know that many people go to work? Some will go to church today. They'll go on family vacations and do all kinds of things in life, just daily life. Eating, drinking, being merry. And do you know what happens every day? Someone in this state, in this country, in this world, falls down dead. It looked normal. It looked healthy. They looked good. But what they didn't know is they had heart disease. They had heart trouble. The heart went unchecked. The Church of Christ at Ephesus had a heart problem. She had heart disease. The church can be busy in the community. The church can teach all the right doctrine. 
The church can be busy with all kinds of get-togethers and fellowships. But if the church is not singularly focused with undivided hearts for Jesus, then it will just become duty, a way of life, routine, religious, and just like a child who plays house. You remember when your kids were little and one day you walked in the playroom or the bedroom or the living room and they were playing house? They were playing marriage? You know what a lot of churches are doing? They're just like Ephesus. They're playing church. And brethren, it thrills me to know that we're helping feed some of our community and close some of our community and inviting them to cool things that we do here and trying to reach out to them and that we have great classes on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, Sunday mornings and that we have a vibrant ladies ministry and an upcoming men's ministry and that we have an unbelievable visitation ministry and our greeting ministry is growing and all these wonderful things are happening and, and I believe that truth is being taught but we got to ask ourselves, are we still in love with Jesus? No, 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 no. You may not understand me this morning. Are you still in love with Jesus? Or has your love for Christ grown weak? Because one thing I've noticed with Marriages that end, for years before it ends, nobody knows. <laughs> what? We did this recently. What? Don't, no, don't even, no, that can't be. I know they didn't get a divorce, and you never knew it. Because for years, they've been playing marriage. And they had heart disease the whole time. And all of a sudden, the lamp goes out. The fire dies. It's over. What about the Wiley Church of Christ? Jesus goes, No, I've got the solution though. <laughs> Isn't it a beautiful thing that the Heavenly Father always provides a solution. You know what the solution is? It's verse 5. He goes, remember, repent, and return. Use your memory. Go back to the way it started in your heads. Turn your life around. Repent. Change your, this is your choice. Change your heart and come back to me, and here's his words, do the deeds you did at first. Hey, is your marriage like that? Oh, nobody even knows. You're on the brink of this thing falling apart. Your love is lost. It's not there anymore. And really, we've been playing that this so well, and people do a really good job. I'll tell you, they do a really good job at playing this off right? They're all giggling with each other and you're like, man, I just saw them. And they were joking with each other and holding hands. They play it off really well. And you go, how do we fix that marriage? Well, I'll tell you what. Number one, remember the way you started. You remember how you fell in love with each other? And you would literally die for each other? You'd do anything for that person. And you put them above you, even, your, their interest above your own interest, go back and start doing those things. Go back and start doing the deeds. Start dating her again. Win her back. Be her knight in shining armor. Start being kind to her. Start lifting her above, and Jesus goes, church, Go back and start doing the things you started with. Which is what? I can't help but think Acts 19. 
start giving, start magnifying Jesus in your life. So, I grappled with this this week. That's what us preachers do, Tim. We grapple with these things. And I have to ask myself, am I busy serving in the kingdom? Am I busy laboring for the Lord? Why? Why, why are you doing it? Why, why are you working in the kingdom? Is it because it's expected? Is it out of duty? Is it because it makes you feel good? Is it because it's what you're used to? Is it tradition for you? Is it because you have a talent, you just like to use it in an area like this? Is it because people would be disappointed and hurt if you didn't? Or is it because you love Jesus and you love souls? Because I'm, what I'm afraid is, the church at Ephesus, they lost their first love because they started doing it out of duty. They started serving and standing up for truth out of duty and not because they love souls. So yes, some of you aren't involved in anything except for coming on Sunday morning, and you need to be involved. You, you need to be a part of the body of Christ. And some of us need to go, you know, I, that's not me. I'm at this and this and this and this, and my thing is this, and I'm serving here, and I'm saying a prayer, and I'm teaching, and I'm serving, and I'm leading, and I'm doing. Why? Why? That's your question. Because my challenge is simple. I decided I don't, I don't know how, how else to do this with you except for put the challenge like this. Have you left your first love? <clears throat> Today, get it back. If you have, or if we have, because when you get your first love back, you know what happens? It changes everything. It changes your spirit. It changes your peace of mind. It changes how you look at your enemies. It changes how you treat your spouse. It changes what you do and what you don't do in the church. It changes how you meet with people, how you run your ministry. It changes everything. Because the why is in place. I don't know. What happened to them? The church at Ephesus, what happened to them? History says they dissolved. Just went away. No church to be found. I don't know. I don't know. That's up to him. I don't know if that's right. But I know one thing. It's what we decide to do with our first love today that determines what Wiley will be in 50 years. As we stand and sing together.